Um, so I'm Michelle Avisar Whiting. Um, I am the editor in chief at the Research Square preprint platform. Um, so I come at the topic of metrics from probably a unique perspective, um, one that's maybe a bit cynical and grumpy, but also hopeful. And that I think that the shift toward more acceptance of open practices like preprints um, will go hand in hand with important transformations in this area, like the ones that um, you all are concerned about with regard to quality and, metri and uh, in methods and research reporting. So the title of this talk comes from a quote from Einstein in the Fuzzy Slippers. Um, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts which really it ends up being the punchline of this entire talk. So if you don't feel like sitting through it all, um, you'll know what the, the TLDR is. But if you do, hopefully you'll come away with a few things that you didn't know, or at least um, I can entertain you with some cartoons and GIFs. Okay, so here's the agenda for this talk. I'm going to cover a brief history of bibliometrics um, and then talk about how journals are measured, how authors are measured, and some alternative metrics and what I'm calling metrics. And then in the second half of the talk, I'll discuss basically why we can't have nice things, why metrics are problematic, um, and some novel attempts at metrics, at new metrics and reform efforts uh, to try and get away from them altogether. Uh, and we'll talk about some ways that uh, researchers might be evaluated in particular. Okay, so, uh, most of you will be familiar with this sort of uh, concept of the research life cycle um, and this link between academic promotion and the number of the publications a researcher has and how often those papers are cited really um, kind of established itself by the mid 20th century and then got repeatedly reinforced over the last few decades. And this yielded the publish or perish mantra which was first referenced um, in 1942 and stems from this idea that there is uh, a continuum from research efforts to peer reviewed publications and then to external funding of, of uh, future research efforts um, and one's tenure and further promotion depends completely on that cycle. Um, so tracking one person's success in this area would of course be really tedious if you couldn't easily quantify it and income metrics, um, which were created to meet that need for institutions. And journal metrics, as I'll mention again um, in later slides, were really created to help libraries decide on the journals that were most important um, for the library to subscribe to. So if we're thinking about first mover events that led to where we currently are, I think it makes sense to start with uh, Alfred Lotka and Samuel Bradford, both of which have laws named after them that you might be familiar with, um, both made early efforts in the, in the 20s and in the 30s to quantify author productivity and journal dynamics, respectively. And um, right, so the fact that they have laws means that this has been fully, you know, uh, recognized. Both of these things tend to uh, follow certain patterns that we can actually track and quantify. Um, and in 1934, the term bibliometry was first used by Paul Outlet and defined as the measurement of all aspects related to the publication and reading of books and documents. So it's kind of the early iteration of, of bibliometrics. And then there was a period of time after World War II during which uh, the number of journals and manuscripts, particularly in the clinical sciences, really began to explode. And it made it much more difficult for people to find relevant research. So this signaled a need for bibliographic tools for indexing. Um, one of the first of these was Medlar's Medical Literature Analysis and Retrieval System, which is the ancestor of Medline PubMed um, and was created by the National Library of Medicine, NLM, in 1964. And this was quickly followed by the Science Citation Index, what you might know as Web of Science now, and of course, several other indices have followed that. And then in 1969, uh, Alan Pritchard coined the, the sort of anglicized version of the outlet term bibliometrics um, and specifically defined it as the application of mathematics and statistics to books and other media. Uh, and here's the cover of, of one of the original publications about bibliometrics um, published in 1976. 
and discussed many of the metrics that we still use uh, today to evaluate um, journals and researchers. So um, finally, coming up on modern times in 1990, uh, retrieval and analysis became much easier with the internet, um, the emergence of the internet. And, and in 1997, we had the first automated citation indexing by a company called Sightseer. And the rest of the story, uh, most of us are sadly old enough to remember. So we know how all of this kind of unfolds over the, the next uh, few decades. So where better to start when you're talking about metrics? Uh, then the, the uh, kind of most hated metric of all, the most used and abused, the journal impact factor, GIF. Um, so Eugene Garfield and Irving Schur created the metric to basically to provide librarians with a simple way to prioritize subscriptions to journals that carry the most scientific, um, paper, uh, most cited scientific papers. But as people are aware, uh, the GIF is used inappropriately in many institutions uh, in the criteria for hiring, promotion, and pro probably firing. And this is because of the common misconception that the GIF is an effective proxy for the quality of a paper uh, in, that's published in that journal. Um, so I recently saw a tweet that said something like, if you hate citation metrics, hate Garfield. Uh, but actually, it seems that Garfield expected that the GIF would be used constructively. Um, he did recognize that in the wrong hands, it might be abused. So what actually is uh, journal impact factor? It's the ratio of citations in any given year to articles published in that journal in the preceding two years, uh, all over the total number of citable items published in those two years. So it's just a ratio. Um, a GIF for 2017 is worked out by counting the total number of 2017 citations to articles in that journal that were published in both 2016 and 2015. Um, and then this number is divided by the number of citable items in that journal in 2015 and 2016. And something that I only recently learned, um, and I, I, I guess a lot of people don't realize, is that what's included as a citable object for the numerator for GIF is not the same as what's included as a citable object for the denominator. So for example, uh, citations to certain front matter, uh, narrative uh, editorials, op-eds and things like that will be included in the numerator, but not in the denominator. And so that's why uh, you see GIF highly favoring journals that tend to have a lot more of that front matter. Okay. so. Uh, you know, here's what the distribution of journal impact looks like with, of course, uh, the vast majority of journals having much lower impact factors and an extremely small proportion having very high ones. But GIF is not the only uh, journal impact metric out there. It's the one we hear about the most often, but if you're clicking around looking at research and you've seen other metrics referenced, and some of them are not uh, predatory metrics, they're like legitimate. Uh, new efforts that have come along often in an attempt to address some shortcoming of, of the journal impact factor. So here's site score. Um, you've probably seen this uh, around, uh, especially on Elsevier. Um, it's developed by Elsevier. It's a bit different because it uses a different citation database. That's maybe the most important difference. It uses Scopus, which, surprise, is Elsevier's own citation index. Um, it also uses a three-year window instead of a two-year window and it has um, a lower thresh threshold for what it can includes as a citable, uh, as citable material. So it it, all the kind of front matter that I was referring to before and things like editorials, letters, and conference papers would all be included. And they are included in both the denominator and the numerator. Uh, and because CiteScore defines citable items in the same way, it doesn't disproportionately weight journals um, that have a lot of front matter. And that's why, uh, when you plot the two metrics against each other, so here in that top plot, um, the nature journals will tend to have higher impact factors than they do site scores relative to all other journals. Uh, Elsevier journals, however, tend to have better site scores versus impact factors, which should surprise no one, uh, but does unfortunately make this metric a bit easier to dismiss um, as kind of a biased 
metric and probably publishers shouldn't be in the business of making journal metrics. All right. So uh, here's another journal metric. This is the Eigenfactor score, which was developed at the University of Washington by Carl Bergstrom and Jevin West. And the, Eigen, the Eigenfactor score calculation is based on the number of times articles from a journal published in the past five years have been cited in the journal citation report. So that original uh, citation index. Um, in the year in question. So like the GIF, it's a ratio um, of the number of citations to the number of total articles. But unlike GIF, it also counts citations in, social, in the social sciences and does not include on any level self citations. Uh, the goal to uh, being to completely, you know, take those out of the calculation because they are biased. They tend to bias the calculation. So the eigenfactor also considers which journals have contributed these citations and more highly cited journals will influence the score more than less cited journals. So the scores are weighted uh, and the scores are scaled so that the sum of all journals scores in JCR is equal to 100. So it's kind of a zero sum game between all of the journals. Uh, so in a, in a calculation like that, as you can imagine, um, the vast majority of journals eigenfactor scores are far below one. You can see this uh, on the plot here. Um, and then you can note that the eigenfactor measures the total number of citations. Therefore, journal A, which publishes a thousand articles a year, will have twice the eigenfactor of journal B, which puts out 500 articles a year. Um, right. So there's some uh, debate as to whether the score is really useful if it's just if it's if it's going to bias in favor of really prolific journals then perhaps it's not much better than a raw citation count uh, but it attempts at least to take out some of the biases that are sort of inherent in the journal uh, impact factor and here's another one um, this uh, it's called a SIMAGO. I couldn't figure out what this what this stands for uh, but side Mago journal rank. Um, I've also seen this sort of scattered around on some uh, publishers websites. It is another variant of the eigenfactor score. Again, in that it counts for uh, both the number of citations received and the performance of the citing journals. Um, so like how, how well those journals are cited actually matters in calculating the, the uh, SciMago score for any given journal. Um, some differences between the two, the SJR, SIMAGO score, is based on a three-year window instead of a five, and it uses Scopus, um, again, which is a larger database of journals than for, uh, Web of Science. And it also has some tolerance for self-citation, unlike the eigenfactor score. Uh, they're arguing that some self-citation is reasonable, but we need to put uh, a cap on it. Um, so. Both of these methods, you'll notice that that was incredibly complex, even for me to explain, uh, probably for all of you to, to even track. Uh, and so both of them rely on complex, uh, you know, mathematical concepts. This this concept is called um, eigenvector eigenvector centrality, and that's behind the iterative weighting that determines the influence of a journal based on. Uh, the performance of other journals in the network. So it's kind of measuring network effects. Um, this is exactly what makes them differ meaningfully from traditional metrics, like the impact factor. Um, but people argue that because it's so um, kind of impenetrable, it makes it somewhat opaque, not easy to replicate. Uh, and again, really neither of them seems to be much better than using just a raw citation count. All right, one more. Uh, this is the last journal metric, and I'm only I'm only reviewing here the most popular ones. Believe it or not, there are lots of others. Uh, so this is the SNP or Source Normalized Impact per Paper score. Uh, this score aims to measure contextual citation impact by weighting citations based on the total number of citations in a subject in a particular subject field. So the impact of a single citation is given higher value in subject areas where citations are less likely and vice versa. So it's correcting for some of the different behaviors that you see uh, in citation practices between scientific fields. 
Um, that's nice because it allows for direct comparison between fields um, of research, uh, direct comparison of scores um, that are that actually means something. Unlike with um, the impact factor, we will see it very wildly between fields. Uh, I'm providing more information on the slide, by the way, than I'm than I'm necessarily saying. So um, that the 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 slide can actually serve, uh, hopefully we'll provide it after the talk and it'll actually serve as a, a resource for you all. Um, okay, so we're moving on now to discuss how authors are measured. There are a lot fewer, let's say, um, formula-based metrics for measuring author performance. And of course, we've already mentioned that the, the GIF has been exploited as a metric um, by which authors have been measured, usually unofficially. But officially, researchers who are being evaluated for whatever reason, grants, hiring, tenure, uh, or other promotion, are judged according to the, the content and frequency of their publications. And that includes um, peer-reviewed uh, publication, peer-reviewed articles, and also a lot of different types of publications that I've listed here. Um, I put preprints on here, of course, because my hope is that preprints um, are increasingly being included in this category. And we know that they are um, certainly, you know, now it's okay to, to uh, cite a preprint for your grant, for example. Um, but, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, especially for early career researchers, that there is more consideration for, uh, for productivity in the way of preprints. Um, but there's also generally consideration for whether the work was published in a very uh, field, uh, very field specific, journal versus one that's more broad, broadly focused, um, and also what the time to publication of first output following the awarding of a grant, which is a metric that um, is really important for funders. So these are, you know, maybe not so much metrics in the strict sense, but ways in which authors are measured. And then our authors are also judged to a surprising degree, as most, most of you will know, um, on the specific placement of their name in an author list. So um, in, many, in many fields, the norm is that the first and the last author carry the most important contribution to the paper. Um, and then importance roughly drops with placement. So this has been uh, become kind of like a hot, uh, hotter topic over time because the frequency of single author papers continues to drop and drop each decade. It's quite rare, rare now in some fields to have single authors. Um, and just in the last decade, the number of, of authorships per individual author has actually increased. Um, so all the while, the total number of articles published every year just continues to go up and up. And so this means that authors are collaborating and co-authoring much more now than they were even 10 years ago. Um, so that's great in the sense that it's easier to get on a paper um, but it may actually be harder to get placed um, in an important position in a long author list. Uh, and, and this stuff does actually really matter to the judges. Okay, so um, another thing that matters, of course, is citations. Um, and, and this can be sliced a number of ways, most of which I've listed here. For example, getting cited uh, by a review article may be weighted more heavily by the committee because reviews articles tend to, uh, review articles tend to highlight the most um, consequ consequential work in a field. Citations from a diversity of journals may indicate a higher level of uh, interdisciplinary appeal, and therefore give the sense that your work has broader impact. Um, and of course, because self-citation is a handy way of manipulating um, citation counts, you know, a careful arbiter will take self-citation into consideration when looking at citations. So these are all the different ways that, um, that someone looking at someone's body of work and citations might uh, look at that data. And then, of course, there are formal metrics um, that are often used within academia and sometimes uh, by funding agencies to estimate author performance. And the most well known of these, of course, is the H index. Um, uh, H is for uh, Hirsch, Jorge Hirsch, who's the, uh, the developer of this index. Um, and it's derived from a formula, formula that uses um, publications and citations to get at a quote, an estimate of the significance and impact of a researcher's contributions. So it's computed by determining the maximum number X 
of one's publications that have been referenced at least X times. So if you have 10 papers that have each been cited at least 10 times, then your H index is 10. And from there, it doesn't matter if you have 10 total papers or 1,000, uh, your H index won't increase to 11 until at least 11 of your papers have been cited at least 11 times. OK, so like other metrics, this one has loads of caveats that should be taken especially seriously, in, in my view, because it's used to metricize individuals. It just has a different feeling to it than trying to put a metric on a journal. Uh, and so you know, one way, one important way that it does this is that it disadvantages younger researchers simply because they haven't had as long a time to build up citations. Uh, and to his credit, Hirsch did propose a way of correcting uh, for that problem by adding a time variable into the formula. But aside from that, the metric can fluctuate wildly depending on the citation database. I mentioned that there's a number of different citation databases that, that are out there. And so depending on the one you use, your H index might come out differently. Um, and it doesn't account for the type of publication either. So um, for example, reviews will tend to be cited more and there's no correction for that. Uh, it doesn't account for the big differences um, in publication and citation practices between disciplines um, or for self citations. And of course, it doesn't account for the context of the citation, which is a, a problem that basically all of these metrics I've talked about share. So uh, according to Goodhart's law, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Um, these graphs come from a paper published a couple of years ago in Giga Science. This paper has a pretty astonishing amount of data on publication trends. I put the link at the bottom. Hopefully all of my slides have source links so that you can go and see exactly where I took all this information from. Um, but yeah, it's got a huge amount of data that looks at the publication trends over the course of the last century um, with the overarching conclusion that these metrics we're using are becoming less and less meaningful or trustworthy and that we really need to come up with better ways of understanding impact um, and ideally ways that are more resistant, if not immune to following Goodhart's law. Um, so th this is just showing you uh, the, the trends in, in self citations over time. And, uh, you know, I think we can draw a straight line between that practice and the incentives uh, on the other end from, you know, having to fulfill these metrics. So just how have these metrics become targets? Well, uh, many of the problems that are confounding them are really human behavior problems. So as soon as you understand how you're being measured, it's natural to look for ways of optimizing those metrics. And this is when we see behaviors such as egregious um, self-citation, reciprocal citation, citation stacking, which is also sometimes referred to as citation cartel. Um, and this is specifically referring to bad behavior on the part of, of journals, editors, uh, those responsible for journals. So these are ways that um, impact factors can really be inflated and like inf inflated to an incredible degree, actually, when editors for example, um, coerce authors to cite papers in their journal or another journal with which they have a reciprocal agreement. Um, here is a graph, this is a graphic um, that shows a really, uh, just really egregious example of this. Um, and this is where, uh, this is in Scholarly Kitchen, the link is on the bottom, where a review article in a journal called the Scientific World Journal cited 124 papers of which 96 or published in the journal cell transplantation, uh, as luck would have it, all in the previous two years. And of the 28 citations remaining, 26 were to papers published in the Scientific World Journal, you guessed it, in the previous two years. So every year, <laughs> Clarivate, which is the company that owns Web of Science Journal Citation Report, has to suspend a number of journals for engaging in these behaviors. And, you know, like they have to kind of stay one step ahead and look at these patterns 
and be very uh, awake to the to the concept that people are looking at these things and trying to gain the system. Um, and those suspension those suspensions are sometimes uh, contested and successfully um, overturned. Uh, that's um, another rabbit hole that I won't get into here, but. But the point is, uh, these things are happening all the time, and um, and you know now it's now it's the responsibility of those uh, those kind of governing bodies, those index, uh, the, those who own the indexes, to keep track of that so that the whole system is not undermined by it. Um, and the metrics also create perverse incentives um, for uh, you know on the individual researcher level which leads to behaviors like this is going to be an increasing in severity, I guess, um, they're essentially trying to get a greater number of individual publications out of the same story that's called salami slicing, uh, duplicate publications, which I, I suspect is somewhat harder to get away with in the digital age, but it does still happen. We've seen it on the preprint server. Um, and then, yeah, again, increasing order of level of offense things like p-hacking, data manipulation, data fabrication, and then the construction of entire papers from thin air um, by paper mills. Uh, and not all of this is driven only by the desire to maximize output and citations. Certainly, there are other reasons for this, but it, it's, it, it is probably a big part of it. Um, and this is the sad reality behind the recent viral meme that seemed to resonate with so, <laughs> there were so many different uh, iterations of that meme and really um, kind of speaking to, you know, everybody in every field sort of uh, uh, seeing that people are just trying to maximize the number of publications I'll write about really anything uh, so that they can get another publication. Um, I, I've put this link here at the bottom to um, a recommended reading. This is Talia Coney's blog post in which he outlines this problem but argues that um, researchers appeal to the bad incentives too often as a defense for bad behavior. Uh, I, I think he's being too idealistic here. Um, this is just human behavior and it's normal uh, for people to want to do this. So we should be aligning our institutions with uh, what, you know, what we hope people's behaviors will be what we hope, um, you know, to get for getting the best, uh, you know, results from our from the, the institution of science. Anyway, it's called uh, it's not the incentives, it's you and it's a really great piece. All right, so the downstream effects of this, as you can see, you know, where this conversation is sort of trending um, are kind of predictable. Uh, I just pulled a few headlines, one of them um, here this one at the bottom is uh, very recent, um, but it speaks to, to the same thing that, you know, what happens downstream of all this is uh, along with, you know, it resulting from problems like publication bias um, and other unsavory features of academic publishing, um, it really has the potential to create a monster at scale. Uh, and one that ultimately hurts everyone and science as an institution. Uh, so, yeah, it's my strong belief that we need to uh, find our way uh, out of this. So I think we've thoroughly covered citation metrics. Now we can move on briefly to uh, the wild world of al alternative metrics, alt metrics. Um, there are a few different flavors of these, most notably uh, those created by alt metric. You know, this donut should, should be very familiar to everyone here. Um, Plum Analytics has a very similar um, widget and um, impact story, which is a little bit different, uh, you know, quite not quite as uh, numbers or metric driven, but also looking at, at the same sorts of things. So this is a really nice and refreshing thing about these metrics is that they tend to focus at the article level. Um, and what all these metrics attempt to do is move away from the traditional focus on citations and think of impact in terms of the general attention that an article is paid by, by journal readers, bloggers, social media, uh, and, and news media. But of course, um, there's been a lot of criticism of these metrics as well, because attention is really only uh, reliably a measure of interest, and it can't serve as a proxy for quality. Uh, I think we can all agree with that. Um, 
and non-citation metrics can also be gamed. So you can buy Facebook uh, uh, likes and, and you can buy Twitter mentions. Uh, you, can, you can find your way to, um, to game that as well. This is the part of the talk where we really start to look forward. Everything until now has been discussing established metrics uh, and their shortcomings. And in a few slides, we'll talk about the concerted efforts at reform. But I would argue that each of the novel metrics that have emerged kind of over the last few years um, is a reform effort in, an, in its own right. Uh, and the first one is top factor. So um, this is a rating based on the degree to which a journal complies with top. This is transparency and openness promotion guidelines, eight of them. Uh, and they're listed here, data citation standards, transparency around data, code and uh, research materials, transparency around design and analysis um, and study pre-registration and analysis plan pre-registration uh, and replication is the last one. And then for each of these, there are three levels or really four if you consider that zero is a level. Um, but for the level of stringency, um, you get either a one, two or three. So it's pretty uh, straightforward. Like you, the journal is either requiring that you uh, disclose this information or, or just requiring a disclosure, they're requiring the actual information in order to publish, or they're requiring and verifying that the input, that's the highest level. So you get a three if your journal both requires and shows, uh, shows evidence of verifying each of these different criteria. That's a really high bar to meet for a journal. Uh, and as you expect, there are many, many journals with, with a score. And I think that's what that graphic was, um, that most journals cannot uh, get even a, a low score for the top factor. Uh, so there are many, many journals with a score of zero, and I think actually none with a perfect score. But the highest top factor for any journal I found was not nature or science, uh, but a journal called Metapsychology. So good for them. Um, they obviously have a, a you know unique uh, level of adherence to these to these kinds of criteria that really matter to the scientific community. Okay, so um, just a couple of other novel metrics here. I think I'm missing another graph. This is odd. Um, the Psi score is the first one. So this is an automated assessment tool that's looking at markers of reproducibility on an article level. So these are things like uh, descriptions of randomization, blinding, um, specifics on materials or samples that are used in the study. Um, and and so, so there is a, this algorithm that just pulls that information from the, uh, from the paper. And so uh, the figure I've shown here is from a paper from, that the folks at SciScore published last year. They described the results of running this tool on 1.5 million articles in PubMed. Uh, and one of the most compelling pieces to me was that there was a clear increase in the size score, you can see it here, for nature articles soon after nature instituted their reproducibility checklist, uh, which is a really you know, thorough checklist that you know, reviews a lot, it covers a lot of the ground that um, I mentioned on the last slide. It's just making sure that people are reporting their, uh, you know, reporting their data appropriately, their statistics appropriately, they're disclosing everything. Um, once they meet all those criteria, that, that's, a, that's a barrier for entry for um, most of the nature journals, I think with the exception of nature communications at this point. Once they've applied those, uh, you can see a clear difference um, after that date in the size score, uh, in the size score that each of those uh, papers achieved. So, um, and applying this score to, to a journal yields a score, they've called it the Rigor and Transparency Index, RTI. Um, and I, I don't know why the, the graph isn't showing up, but when you plot RTI, which is size scores, Rigor and Transparency score against impact factor, what do you know? There is zero correlation between the two. Uh, in fact, if anything, there seems to be a slight negative <laughs> trend. Uh, which just means that, you know, impact factor has very little to do uh, ultimately with 
you know, some of the, the markers of, uh, of robust reporting that have become, you know, really important to the scientific community. Um, Repetta is another automated tool I want to mention here. Um, it's dedicated to um, quantifying the degree of, of reproducibility and falsifiability of an article um, based on, again, some of these same open science criteria. There's overlap, but they, they, um, they look at different things as well. All right, here's another very exciting, um, Carol will know that, that I am excited about this one because this is what gave her the, the uh, impetus to invite me to give this talk was that I was speaking to her about this metric or this uh, tool called Site, uh, Site.ai. So this is, a, this is a tool that brings a metric with it. So Site, as you'd expect from the name is actually a citation counting tool, but what it introduces that's novel is a consideration for context. So the tool finds citations and then uses machine learning to analyze the content of the citation and try to get an understanding of whether the citer is indicating support, contradiction, or merely mentioning the other study uh, like in a neutral way. And then it presents these values in a badge. Um, this is a, just a screenshot from our platform uh, of the site badge and you can see, um, you know, this particular paper has 26 mentioning citations, zero that contradict it and nine that support it. So, you know, they've pulled this out of sort of the sentiment or the, the tone of the words around the citation. And that should matter, you know, when you're thinking about uh, whether, uh, whether work is reproduced, what, re reproducible, um, and what the what other uh, people in the community that have been, are doing similar work are actually saying about the work in question. So I'm ac I'm really excited about having um, I mean, recently introduced this badge on our preprints on Research Square um, because the hope is that it can serve as a sort of uh, quality signal for the preprint since it's become increasingly common for preprints to collect citations um, before they're reviewed and published. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm running a little bit short on time here. I don't want to like, uh, okay, like I'll keep going for now. So, um, okay, so site, if you look at sites uh, output on a researcher level, here's mine. Um, site found 994 individual citations to papers I've been an author on. Uh, and the vast majority of them have just been, have simply been mentioning one of my findings. But what, what remains, you know, I was very pleased to see uh, is mostly positive, and I have a few uh, a few that are categorized as contradictory. One of the ways that, that people have been sort of critical of this metric is that saying that something is, is contradictory doesn't always mean something negative about that study, right? It doesn't always mean that someone took it and wholesale tried to replicate it. So um, sometimes you're using a different model or you're using, a, you know, there's some other important reason why uh, your result would have been different from the result that you're citing. Um, but I actually found, you know, I find this to be useful as well. And I found, and then I think that they're, they're also changing the way they're referring to this to make it not have a negative valence to it because it doesn't necessarily mean something negative, but it's worth looking into. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I think is very valuable for researchers to see, okay, you know, in the body of citations that I have, there seems to be, a, there's a congregation of, of contradictory citations with this one particular study or this one particular finding. And that's something useful to chase down. Um, another uh, thing that Cite has done is found a very creative way to turn this output into a journal, in, uh, journal metric um, because everyone loves a journal metric. So they've, they've created a formula for that as well. Um, and uh, just, just a couple of days ago, I asked the CEO uh, of Site to, to provide me, I said, have you ever plotted impact factor against this SJI, as they call it, the Site Journal metric? Uh, and he said, oh, yes, we have. And he sent me, the, he sent me this plot. And again, um, they're completely not correlated, which is exactly what you would, uh, would expect from uh, something that's taking into account an important uh, piece like context. Uh, but the, the GIF loads just fine, which is great. Um, 
So not all traditional metrics are well received. Um, ResearchGate has an author score, which is criticized for being largely opaque. And also uh, it's based on uh, you know, some criteria that are kind of tangential to publication success or quality. Um, I recently saw this one, the journal authority factor, which is the um, average H index of the journal's senior editors. And as you can imagine, this elicited nearly an audible groans throughout Twitter um, when someone surfed it, surfaced it a few weeks ago. Uh, and just for fun, here is the formula for the Kardashian index, which <laughs> measures the discrepancy between a scientist's social media profile and their publication record. Um, and it's calculated as the number of Twitter followers that, are, that a scientist has over the number that they should have given the number of citations they have. Uh, but of course, this reinforces the supposed uh, importance of citations as a measure of quality or impact. So uh, take that as you will. I'm also crediting Michael Hoffman here with my use of metrics, um, as I saw him use it on Twitter. OK, so uh, just I'm going to be wrapping up soon. But the, the last bit of this is just how do we get out of this mess? Um, and you know we're all kind of complicit in this uh, quantifrenia, which is a great term I learned while preparing for this talk. Um, so because we're all human and these institutions have really cemented these tendencies, I think it's going to require institutions to get us out. Um, and this comes in the form of commitment to new norms. So these, uh, what I've listed here is a number of such efforts. Uh, you know, I'm going to let you all look at, into them uh, on your own because I don't have the time to get into all of them. But uh, the most well-known one that you might have heard of is DORA or the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. Um, and uh, the common goal for DORA uh, with all of these is to push toward new frameworks for evaluation that explicitly reject the use of those classical metrics as proxies of quality and use them, if at all, to support rather than supplant expert scrutiny. Um, and in particular, you know, holistic, multidimensional assessments of individuals whose careers hang in the balance. Um, and so just a little bit more on this. And uh, again, this is this I took basically entirely from an article I read called Living with Dora, which is which is linked at the bottom. Um, but this, that lists a number of ways that committees can, you know, you know hiring committees, uh, tenure committees can assess researchers, um, you know, what, what does it take realistically to move away from the reliance on metrics, uh, you know, do these evaluations uh, more thoroughly, but less frequently, you know, is one, look at the best, look at their best work in their own words, look for their worst, look for, you know, have they been mentioned on PubPeer, which is, you know, a, a famous now uh, site for, for finding uh, instances of, of fraud or manipulation or other concerns about a researcher. This is the kind of person that's applying uh, for, for tenure or, for, or applying for a position, then maybe that's enough. Maybe that's knowing that, that, that they uh, can display these behaviors is enough for you to know you don't need to proceed further, even if they have a, a whole host of nature publications, right? Um, uh, and, and emphasize competence, like look at the skill set. Do they actually understand the, the techniques that they reference in their papers? Reward replication. Replication is rare. You know, it doesn't, it, we don't see lots of evidence of replication, but this is where the things like, like the site score uh, and new tools that'll help us get at that will, um, will, will help us do an assessment of whether work replicates. Um, and value, value good mentorship. Um, there's been a lot of conversations about this on Twitter, you know, over the last few years about uh, the, the abuses that take place on the part of mentors and how, how just uh, critical it is um, to be hiring supportive uh, people into these roles, uh, much more important than how many uh, high impact publications they can churn out. Okay, um, and then on, on the virtuous behaviors uh, end of things, this really starts at the committee level um, when considering grants, hiring, promotion, um, emphasizing the principles of open science reproducibility in those contexts. 
is what will uh, really feed the virtuous cycle. And these, these values should carry all the way through and be reinforced by publishers. And they have, they have probably the most important role in setting the standard uh, of value at the publication level. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, I think we are putting the pressure on and, and I think it's leading to change now. So I'm very, very positive about the outlook. Um, I'm going to leave you with this. This is just just a joke, but um, it's PhD comic showing you the the only real way to calculate your impact factor. Um, so uh, yeah, that, I'm going to leave you with that, and we can go into questions if there are any. Great, thanks, Michelle. I think. I, but sorry, is it okay if we before we take questions, we'll just go into the last poll, and then maybe sure. while the poll is running, you can we can um, we can take a question. Sounds good. Great, thanks. Okay, so Triprian will just be launching the poll. So, um, but in the meantime, the first question that we have is from Peter. And Peter asks, what is your assessment of expert scape as a metric? Expert scape? I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. Um, Peter, can you can you explain where you get that from, or a little bit more? Are you online? I'm here, Hi. <laughs> but I can't. You 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 blocked the video, so I can't get on the video. Can you hear me? Yes, definitely. All right. Um, anyway, uh, so it's a private uh, organization. I looked into this because I noticed that um, uh, the, an F expert scape review was being used as the basis for accolades from a publicly funded organization. Uh, and um, I wondered who they are. Uh, it's a cardiologist and a business entrepreneur that run this company. They have their own metric of expertise, not validated against anything else, including any of the measures that you discussed very eloquently today. So uh, I was just curious, I, I, would, I would really be interested in your assessment since you seem to be an expert in this area. Um, of whether th that measure, they, they value review articles above, uh, for example, you know, a high impact uh, article on a randomized trial. But if you're an author on a review article, you get way more points. Anyway, uh, if yeah. you don't know what it is, it's okay. But, I, but maybe offline, you can, uh, if you left me your email, we can come talk about it. Yeah, I, I've, ne I've not heard of it, but I'm now very intrigued. Um, at, at first, uh, that makes me feel a little skeptical to hear that someone just made up a, a metric uh, kind of on their own. But to think, you know, just the way that you're describing it sounds like it might be more substantive, um, certainly, than some of these other metrics. So, yeah, I'll definitely look into it. Thank you. Thank you. I just put, Michelle, your, um, your email in the chat. Sure. Okay, and then we have um, just a comment by Alexandra Yip, who says, will the speaker slides be available as well? This presentation is very relevant to my research team's work currently with the CNODES KT team at Dalhousie University. Absolutely, I, I'm happy to provide it and I'll look into what happened with those uh, corrupted images as well so that, that everything comes oh, through. Thank you. Yeah, so for everybody out there, so we, what we'll do is we'll just um, email everybody that has signed up and we'll send out um, hopefully the recording, we'll, we'll say when the recording's up and also Michelle's slides as well. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Okay, so uh, our next question is from Stacy who asks, what can preference servers do um, to address duplicate publication, should they be do what? What should preprint servers be doing to address this issue? Yeah, um, duplicate. Pro so, Stacy, I'm going to make an assumption, but I'm, I'm happy for you to jump in and, and clarify if I get it wrong. Um, but I, I'm assuming here that what you mean by duplicate publication is a true duplicate publication, so not just a preprint then being published, which uh, in, in the general sense, isn't considered a duplicate publication because in a general sense, preprints aren't considered publications. Like they certainly are publications, right? They are published works. Um, but we, we always are careful not to say published when we're referring to them because that's a term that's sort of been reserved for the uh, practice of, of you know, uh, uh, expert, expertly scrutinizing through peer review and, and endorsing um, by a valid journal. Um, and what we've seen 
uh, is that this happens. Um, we are we're a, a preprint server that's actually integrated with uh, around 500 Springer Nature journals. Um, and so what we end up getting is a lot of public uh, or a lot of uh, preprints that are under review currently at a journal. Um, and what happens when you post a preprint is that suddenly everybody in your field is able to see it while it's under review uh, long before they would have otherwise been able to look at it. And so you get a lot of eyeballs on this posting and including uh, you know, people who have possibly seen that same publication somewhere else. Um, and what we found is that we can find a, a lot of strange behaviors or questionable behaviors because people don't fully consider the consequences of posting their work online. Um, if they're doing something, if they're, you know, for example, plagiarizing or uh, doing some other shady behaviors, it's suddenly under scrutiny of a lot more people than just the two arbitrary reviewers that have been selected by an editor, right? It's suddenly sort of under review by everyone in your field. And so these things come to light. Um, what we've been able to intercept them um, at times just by virtue of people reaching out or a comment being made or a Twitter you know, post being made about a preprint that's up. Um, they're saying, you know, this paper's already published here and now it's under review at such and such journal, what's going on? And I can pick up on that and contact the editor and say, yeah, the, this is definitely a, a, dupl a true duplicate publication. Generally, why I said that duplicate publication is not a, probably less of a problem now is because we have systems like Crossref um, in place that are issuing DOIs and, and all of the metadata that comes with it. So that's the, you know, the title and the author list. And if there is a true duplicate and it's, you know, within uh, s several weeks after one uh, publication already went up, you know, it will be obvious, uh, it, will, it will come up as a, as a plagiar, basically as 100% overlap or whatever with, a, with an, another publication. The limitation there is that uh, if it's published in a predatory journal that doesn't issue DOIs, then uh, then Crossref is not going to have it in its index and it won't necessarily come up in a plagiarism check. This is one of those things that uh, everyone kind of, no one has really talked about that I've seen. Uh, lots of predatory journals don't issue DOIs because it costs them money. Um, and, and so they're not actually pulled into plagiarism check software. All right, thank you. I'm not sure if that fully answered the question, but i um, happy for you to elaborate, Stacey. Okay, well, Stacey asked another question, actually. Um, I think it's Stacey, let me just, yeah, yeah. She said, should article level metrics pertaining to the preprint and journal articles of the same study be combined? And if so, how? That's a, such a great question. It's one that we um, keep talking about. Um, and I think it's at this point, you know, it's something that we really need input from researchers on, whether they think that there's value. Um, there's certainly value in keeping these things separate in terms of their DOIs, because I think it's, you know, preprints, even different versions of preprints can differ from each other and they might have supplied more data. You know, they might have added figures that weren't in a previous version. And so when somebody is citing a preprint, we wanna be very specific about what they're referring to. Um, and then likewise with the, the journal uh, article or the version of record, it often, uh, I wouldn't say that it differs, you know, substantially uh, very often from the preprint, but it might have, um, you know, new information in it that wasn't captured in, 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 a, in the preprint version or any of the versions of the preprint. So um, I, I, there is definitely value in making sure that those things remain discrete. But when we're talking about article level metrics, like attention, uh, you know, alt metrics, for example, uh, is there really, uh, you know, is, is it really valuable to, to um, separate the different versions out? Um, it dilutes the metric for sure. Um, what we decided to do on our preprint server is to combine at least the versions of the preprint in terms of metrics. So we stopped 
looking at individual. This is something we were doing originally is that for alt metrics, we were separating them out and we decided to just show an aggregate um, alt metric. It just didn't seem like, it, it seemed more valuable to do it that way. Uh, but as far as separating it from the journal article, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm really curious what other people think um, and maybe it's valuable to see both. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. So um, Stacy says, you mostly answered my question. I would be curious as to whether you have seen duplicate preprints across preprint servers and whether those would be picked up by Crossref's plagiarism check too. Huh. Yes, um, there are duplicate preprints across preprint servers and there's actually, uh, because preprint servers are the wild west still, I think, um, there are no clear rules of engagement here. So there, uh, there is nothing, even in the governing bodies that do exist for, for preprint servers, uh, there's no explicit um, preclusion to like posting a preprint in two different preprint servers. Uh, and this doesn't really work to the benefit of an author. I don't understand why they do it. Um, unless, you know, some authors believe that this looks like it's inflating their publication record, you know, if you, each entry will have a new entry on ResearchGate. So at first glance, if someone's not looking carefully, it might look like a lot more publications if you've posted them on all of, you know, 20 of the, the preprint servers that are out there. Um, at the moment, you know, we don't, we, we don't work really hard to prevent duplications. Um, I've actually written a whole blog post on this. Uh, it's called On Duplications um, or On Duplicates uh, on the Research Square blog um, because it's, it's a topic that comes up a lot and I am worried about it. Like I don't like this fracturing of, um, you know, information and the fact that there are, you know, exact replicas on different re preprint servers. I don't think it helps anybody, including the author. So um, I think we need we need a way to deal with that. Yes, they do show up on uh, plagiarism checks, on authenticate checks, um, but most journals know to ignore uh, anything that looks like a preprint. You know, if it if it's associated with a preprint, they won't they won't consider it plagiarism uh, or duplicate pu publication. So that actually comes up in my mind, like, I mean, I, I reason why, you know, for example, it would be good to have it on multiple preprint surfaces is for advertising, right, to like disseminate your research. Is there any way to like do that using the same DOI as say, for example, like one preprint server has? I don't, uh, not, not that I know of, because the, the preprints, the, the individual preprint servers have um, dedicated DOI, like so the root DOI of our preprint server is, I don't remember what it is, but it's like four numbers um, mm -hmm. that is discrete from, um, you know, what BioArchive uses, for example. And it's the same, you know, if it's a, ta you know, if it's posted on that, on that server, it will have that DOI. And so I don't think there's a way, what, what might be possible um, and potentially, you know, something for, for us and the other servers to look into is linking. Um, and, and that's something that can go all the way down to the index level. So, you know, you can, you can imagine a scenario where, yes, yeah, so, you know, I do have, you know, different version of this, different versions of this preprint on different servers, but they're linked. Um, so when you're looking at any one of them, then you have, for example, a list of associated articles, you know, perhaps on different preprint servers, and you can look at, you know, you can even, they can be time stamped so you can see them in order of, you know, when they were posted on each of the servers. Um, and that's certainly, you know, that there's a technical challenge there, but it's not insurmountable for sure. And I think that would be an ideal scenario. Now, even better than that would be for Google Scholar. And I, I know that Google Scholar is investing some in this kind of, uh, in both like disambiguation and version uh, version organization of scholarly um, outputs. And they've actually done quite a good job. So if you look up, you know, any given article, um, you'll find multiple versions of the article and it will privilege the version of record at the top. And then you'll see kind of like different versions of the same one, perhaps at different preprint servers. It's not perfect, but they might be in a better position because they have kind of ownership of that whole, uh, the whole landscape to, to do a good job of, of organizing that. And then once they've done that, we can, we'll be able to, pull in 
that information, you know, into our server so that no matter where somebody is, they can see all the versions that are related to a given preprint. Yeah, great. And then we just have one last question from Izzy who asks, are articles from predatory journals cited more or less frequently? Huh. Great question. Um, I hope much less, and I, and I assume you mean less frequently than non-predatory journals. Um, I, I should hope that they are fairly infrequent, uh, and, and I should hope that, that anybody, um, you know, who's, uh, that people are aware um, that these types of journals are out there. By the way, not all of them don't issue DOIs. There are journals that have predatory practices that do, dish, do issue DOIs, so it makes them a lot harder to discover. I do have a whole talk on predatory uh, journals and predatory metrics um, as well. But, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, I think it's very difficult to um, track the citation, uh, you know, uh, numbers on predatory versus non-predatory. And, and one of the complicating factors there is that we, we haven't all agreed on a definition for those things. Uh, you know, there was a point at, you know, the point in which, you know, uh, Beal, who, who created Beal's List, um, was really maligned for essentially just disparaging a whole set of open access journals, you know, it's like open access, you know, and there are definitely people who consider most open access journals to be predatory in a sense, because, you know, the shift to open access meant you're transferring the burden of, of um, payment to the, to the author. Right, so you're asking for money to publish a paper, and that was kind of a new, new concept just 20 years ago. Um, and I think there's more acceptance around it now, but there are certainly people who who still think that that OA is as inappropriate um, and exploitative, and and that some OA journals, no matter how solid their practices are, have like a feeling of predatoryness around them. Um, so I think once we can get to a better, you know, honest definitions about what we mean by predatory and what we should mean by it, in my view, is just an, an absolute dishonest, uh, you know, um, front for, for a, a scholarly institution, right? Like the, these things are not reviewed or not reviewed in any substantive way. They are completely opaque. They uh, you know, uh, don't list an advice uh, in, in an editorial board, you know, uh, that that's trackable. They don't answer their emails. They, you know, there's a bunch of dead links on their site, you know, we can agree on, you know, what the, what the uh, archetype for, for this is. And then we can get to understanding, you know, so understanding what the behaviors around citations are around them. But it's a really good question. It's a, it's a worrying one. Yeah, so he has actually a follow-up question. Izzy, do you want to just ask your follow-up question to Michelle directly? Sure. It's, you know, my, my, my question really is based on the recent report of a few weeks ago that non-reproducible findings are likely to be cited more often. So such non-reproducible findings or papers are actually more likely to be published in predatory journals. I, I don't. I don't think that that's necessarily true. Um, I think what we're finding is just non-reproducible work is being published everywhere, and that that's part of the the kind of central thesis of this talk is that you know what's been uh, what what's been privileged above work that you know is at minimum falsifiable, meaning you've you've provided at least enough information for somebody to replicate or falsify your work. Um, you know, that hasn't been privileged over things like just having a really a strong positive result, uh, having a really interesting story, um, you know, doing very expensive research that outputs, uh, you know, something that's just particularly compelling to a broad audience. Um, those are the, the types of findings that get the traction and that get the that ultimately get the citations, right? And they get the traction, they get published in the good journals and the good journals, and this tends to be like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The, that kind of work gets published in the, in the high impact journals that are not all necessarily doing the work to make sure that it's done properly, that it can be trusted. Um, so, I, so you know, I think certainly a lot of it is published in predatory journals, 
Uh, but I think perhaps even the bigger concern is that a lot of it is not, you know. Yeah, great, Michelle. I just wanted to heartfully thank you for this great presentation. It was it was wonderful. I really learned a lot. And and hopefully maybe you can come back in 2022 and talk to us about your predatory journal uh, presentation and metrics. That'd be great. I would love that. Excellent. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you next month.